This morning is exciting because we're starting a brand new series called I Believe. So, I Believe. It's built on the Apostles' Creed. Apostles is the plural form. It means multiple apostles. You see the apostrophe there too? It means it belongs to them. The Apostles' Creed. And um, the question for today is, why this series? The reason this series is because it's so important is I believe with probably great uh, conviction, with great conviction, and probably with a lot of you, uh, agreement with you, that this has the potential to be a tumultuous year. That 2024 has probably already started off that way in a lot of ways, especially when it's an election year for presidential candidates. We've seen from the past that they gets pretty dicey and pretty divisive. The enemy of you and I, which would be Satan, the enemy loves to come in and stir things up. The Apostles' Creed is one of those great things that God has given to us uh, through church history that allows us to have this centering, this, this piece of, of, of belief, this doctrine, this, this document that helps us understand what is it that we agree on and where do we have our unity as a church. Because you're going to have a lot of things to disagree on this year. If we just went around the room, as small as we are, and, and just talked about our political beliefs on certain things, we would probably vary quite a bit in a lot of ways, and to the point where we might feel awkward talking about it. Amen? Sometimes it's just better not to talk about it. And so this is a way for us as a church to find our foundation, because you will be challenged this year to love people that you don't naturally love. You will be challenged to even want to tolerate their presence. Maybe not. Maybe you're that far ahead of me, but that, I'm, I'm speaking for me anyway. I'm going to be challenged. And so what's going to ground me? What's going to have me here? What's going to, to, to have me unshakable? I don't want to be shakable. I don't want to be uh, going from one emotion to another all over. I don't want to be solid. I want to be firm. I want to be resolute. What does that? Well, it's, it's got to be Christ. So creeds are really important because, not because we can remember them and then everything's fixed. The creeds set the table for us to, to have our focus on the one in a proper way who is Jesus. It has our focus on Him, but it keeps us from focusing on one little aspect of Jesus and only focusing on that at the expense of the other parts of our faith. That's where cults kind of come in. They'll take one nugget of truth of who Jesus is and then just focus on that. A creed is, is, is beautifully written. I want to challenge you too uh, as well for this year. This, this series goes through Easter, it's gonna, which is not that far away. I mean, we're already just 12 weeks away from Easter already. It's, it's, it's kind of, which I'm excited about because it's going to be warmer by then, hopefully. Um, but, and, and Easter is always, you know, it's the Super Bowl of Christianity. I mean, if it weren't for the resurrection, Christianity doesn't exist. So I want to challenge you to make a commitment this new year. From now until Easter, I want to challenge you to be here every week. Some of you are already have things scheduled and you can't do it. But I want to challenge you to do that every week, to, to come here and be resolute because God does reward us and and, and affirm us in our faith to Him. He, he, he sees our actions to Him. He responds to that. Coming to church isn't the key to your faith, but it is indicative of where your faith is. Like if you're, if you're thirsty for the Lord, you're thirsty for uh, this power and the presence of God, then church is part of those things where we encourage one another in our faith to keep going. Because when we're isolated, we're easy pickings for the enemy. We're weak. We come together and we enjoy the Lord's presence together, and it changes us. And so that's today's message. Believing changes us. So the series is I Believe. And today we're talking about just kind of the overall part of believing. What does that mean? And the successive weeks, this is kind of the, this is not kind of, this is the introductory message for the series. Next week we jump into the creed itself and we're going to work our way through it and see how this creed developed. You get lots of information that's going to tie us not only to Jesus, but tie us to church history, centuries dating back all the way to when Jesus was here himself. Believing changes us. The word believe is a complex word. It's not a simple word. And it's one that Jesus used early on. In fact, the first words 
in, that recorded of Jesus in the book of Mark were this. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. This is what Jesus said. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and what? Believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. So the Apostles' Creed is not a creed that was written by the apostles. It is a creed that is put together based on the apostles' teachings. That's why it's plural with the apostrophe. They're crediting it back. The word creed in English comes from the word credo in Latin. A lot of English comes from Latin. And so credo in deum is what uh, the, the Latin phrase, and that means this right here specifically. Credo in deum means I believe in God. So many of our English words come from Latin, and Latin was the language of educated Christians for more than a thousand years. That's a long time, right? That's a millennium. A thousand years, educated Christians, Latin was the language. So church services were held in Latin. The Apostles' Creed was also only known in this language for more than a thousand years. So the opening line in Latin is this, credo in deum, which means I believe in God. You may be familiar with these Latin words from choral works of composers such as Bach, Haydn, Mozart, or Beethoven. The English word creed comes from credo, and it means believe. Believe. It's a statement of faith. This is what I believe. Now, ultimately, the, the creed, the roots of this Apostles' Creed is in the New Testament itself. All of it dates back to the Bible. The early church had the most simplest of creeds before this, and the most simplest of creeds was this, Jesus is Lord. So if you want to memorize a creed, I'm going to challenge you to memorize the Apostles' Creed too. But this is one you can memorize right now. Jesus is Lord. This was the earliest creed that we know of in the New Testament. So when someone claimed this, what they were doing is they were stating their loyalty and commitment to Jesus as Lord. Jesus is Lord. There was no one before Jesus. They were stating specifics about Jesus and his relationship to God. They were claiming a few things. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is worthy of worship. This led to a need for clarification as the church started moving forward. It's a difficult thing to understand. By the 4th century, the Apostles' Creed, we know it was more than a set, uh, more or less a set of slight variations. It, it was eliminated in the 7th century. So there were a few variations, and they, they brought it down to one around the 7th century. And so this creed is a wonderful summary of the Apostles' teaching concerning the Gospels. Even though it wasn't written by the Apostles, it's taking their writings and forming a creed. It was also tied to baptism in um, uh, the Apostles' Creed anyway. It was also tied to baptisms in the early church. So basically it was a profession of faith by converts. They would get up and they would recite this. It formed the basis of their learning so they would memorize it and they would, they would go through this over and over. And when we learn this creed, it connects us to the history of the church. You know, Carrie sent me, a, my wife is Carrie, for those of you who don't know. Carrie sent me a, a reel last night that I look, didn't look at this morning because I was already asleep because uh, I just fell asleep early. And so uh, I looked at this morning and it talked about, um, it was this woman who was talking about in a hundred years we're all going to be dead and gone, right? And our, our memories are going to be with only a few people. And it just talked about reframing. If it doesn't matter, if it's not going to matter a hundred years from now, should it matter now? If it's not going to matter five years from now, should it matter now? Just kind of a perspective shift. And I thought, hmm, that's right. I won't necessarily be remembered except maybe by a handful of people, but probably not even that. I don't know my great-great-parents. So this creed actually is going to connect us back throughout church history and connect us back to our ancestors. Not in some super spirituality way where we're going to be talking to them, having conversations with them, but reminding us that this faith that we have isn't something that you just came up with, but it has endured forever. 
The teachings go back not only to the beginning of the Apostles' Creed, not only to the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, not only the New Testament, which predated or succeeded, succeeded that, predated, but it actually goes back to Jesus. It goes back to creation. This takes us all the way back to the very beginning. So I want us to, to look at There are other creeds in the church, but this is the oldest and simplest creed, uh, which recognized uh, is recognized as an authority within Christianity. So that's why I chose the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to read it for us and then uh, give you four points for today's sermon. So the Apostles' Creed goes like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Just jumping back, you'll notice there's an asterisk here on the word Catholic. Just as a clarification, that doesn't mean like Roman Catholic Church. Catholic here literally means the united, the one church of God. So the, when Jesus has the body of Christ, the one church that is Christ, that, that means Catholic. So it's a little c instead of a capital C, if that makes any sense. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward for us to read today. That is known as the Apostles' Creed. The reason we chose I Believe as the title of our series is because it is said three times in this creed. The words, I believe, is stated three times. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. Those are the three persons of the Holy Spirit. Trinity that is stated that I believe in this creed. And going back again, Jesus said this, The time is fulfilled. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and what? Believe. Believe. The good news. Here Jesus says repent. Repent means to turn away from the world, turn away from sin, turn away from whatever is not God and then turn to Jesus and believe. It's not a simple word that has just one thing, one meaning. It's a rich word worth exploring, and that is believe. What we do, when we do, as Jesus said, we repent and believe the gospel, that belief, that believing changes our lives. Believing changes us. We no longer remain the same person. We cannot remain the same person if we're truly believing, and we'll talk more about that. We've got four points. We'll start with number one because that just makes sense. And number one means believing means agreement. So the first way believing changes us, believing means agreement. Simply put, when you say this creed, you're believing it, you're saying, I agree that this is true. I agree with this. I believe there is a God, and I affirm the existence of Him. This is essentially the starting point of this. I believe this to be true. I believe this to be true. When, I, when we read, I believe in God, we can stop at this point and think, I am of conviction that there is a God. I am in agreement with this. So while this is true and essential first step, it's not the fullness of what believe means. It goes further than just believing that it is true. But we have to start here. We confess that we are in agreement also, not when we say this creed together, not just that there is one God, but we're also in agreement with one another. I'm looking for ways to find agreement with you, which is going to be challenging this year when there's going to be so many ways that we can divide between one another. Where we can start looking for ways that, I don't like the way you vote. I don't like the way you talked about that. I don't like that joke you just said. That was offensive to me. We can find so many ways to divide. So what are we looking to agree on? This Apostle Creed leads us to find that agreement that we can hold to. It's not just my personal relationship with Jesus that I'm focused on here. I am part of a body of Christ. And I can't be the best follower of Jesus without your help and vice versa. We need one another to become more and more like Christ. And we do that through encouraging and being here for one another. 
the one true church. I'm in agreement with whoever believes this, and it brings unity to us. It brings peace on a basis now that we're looking at our commonality and not looking for those divisive issues. So this is the first point. Believing means agreement. Agreement with God and agreement with one another. The second one is this. Believing means trust. The word believe goes deeper than just believing it to be true. It means more than that. There's an active part of believing. When these words were written in Latin, uh, credo in deum, there were a few possible translations that we could choose in English form. So when you go from one language, a lot of you know multiple languages. When you go from one to another, sometimes there's, not just a, there's just not a good fit. In fact, the word baptism is not a good fit. There wasn't one uh, that was really good for baptism. Uh, you know, when, when you read baptism, which is a baptizo in the Greek, and you translate it over, uh, translation would be more immerse. That's what it means. It means to immerse. Baptism or baptizo means immerse. But what English has done is they created a new word and they transliterated, which means they took the characters of the Greek alphabet and just formed it over into English and created a new word, baptism. Does that make sense? So translation means what does it mean? Transliteration is kind of forming a new word. So that's where baptism comes from. So when you go from one language to another, it's not always just easy to say that that's what it means. So there's multiple translations that were good for credo in deum. And one of those is, instead of I believe in God, one of those is this. Put my confidence in. See, belief, when we think believe, we think, oh, that's just true. I believe in gravity. Gravity's true. I believe it. And in some ways, I do put my confidence in it. But believe, believing in something, in, in this specific instance, credo means to put your confidence in something. It's like when you're driving a car and you need to slow down, you have confidence in your brake pedal. That is, when you push the brake pedal, your car will stop. You're putting your confidence in something. You're trusting it. Which means to put my confidence in and to put my trust in. So I believe means confidence. It means trust. It means I'm affirming my trust in God. It's recognizing God has done something wonderful for us through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and responding to that with, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confident in this. I am actively believing in you. Ultimately, this creed, you know, I want to be careful with this. The creed isn't something that I'm wanting you to believe in. As a Christian, we believe not in something, but in someone. The creed leads us to believe in Jesus, not in a creed, not in a certain functions. Even my challenging you to come to church every Sunday. You know, your faith is not in that. Your faith was in, is in Jesus. This belief is like a, an anchor to an anchor on a boat. I went snor- you might love snorkeling. I love snorkeling. Yeah, just, just me? A few? Okay. All right, yep, there we go. All right, got more. So uh, a few years ago, I got to go snorkeling in St. John, the Virgin Islands, which is just gorgeous down there. Um, and we took a boat out, and on the boat, we got to our spot that we were going to go. Uh, Christmas Cove is the name of it, if you've ever been there. Lots of turtles. If you like to swim with turtles, I do. It's a lot of fun. Um, and so the first mate, when we got out there, threw the anchor. I actually didn't throw the anchor over. There was a a buoy. So you go to the buoy and you clip on to the buoy. And so when we started snorkeling around the boat, I looked and this buoy, which is floating, it has this long, thick cord tied to uh, an anchor at the bottom. And the anchor is this long corkscrew. So basically it just, they just take it like an auger and it goes deep into the sand and there's this eye, right? A big eye and then they hook on the buoy to. So we were able to put our confidence and our trust in the buoy when we anchored the boat we were all able to get off the boat and go snorkeling all we wanted, knowing that the boat was going to stay there, as long as what we were anchored to was stronger than the forces of, that were affecting the boat. So if a storm had come up, a hurricane, it could have possibly torn that away because of the strength of that could have been more than the anchor. But it, it wasn't. So we put our trust in that. And so in the same way, what are we anchored to in our lives? Are we anchored to Christ or are we anchored to maybe something that we, sometimes we can anchor ourselves to our obedience. 
anchor ourselves to our actions towards God. If we are anchored to Christ, then nothing is going to be stronger than Him, and you will find strength all year long. Every day, you can just rest in knowing that nothing is stronger than Jesus. There's a roll call in Hebrews 11 of people who trusted in God and they acted on their faith. And so faith is defined as at the beginning of the chapter as being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so Abraham was called to go, go to a strange land to receive his inheritance, and he trusted God and he went. And all those mentioned in that chapter, it says, believed God could be trusted. And they acted on their belief. Then they were encouraged to follow God. And we are encouraged to follow God based on their examples. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the, hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the things that hinder isn't always sin. Sometimes it's, it's can be good things that are weighing us down that we need to let go of. So let go of that. Let go of the sin that easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Fixing our eyes on who? Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter, which you may know of the author and the finisher of our faith, right? That he's the one who started it and he's perfected it. For the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose Heart. So believing is more than agreeing. There is a God who saved us. It is actively placing your trust in Him, leading us to take those steps of faith. Believing is trusting. Believing is hooking to the buoy of Jesus that is anchored in Him. Number two, believing is tr means trust. And the third one is this. Believing means commitment. Believing means commitment. In the early church, the creed was connected to a person's baptism, their public declaration of faith in Jesus. They were declaring their commitment to the Lord and to believing in His good news when good news means gospel. Baptism is believing and is, is saying that I believe in Jesus and I am committed to the Jesus in marriage, we enter into a covenant with a husband or wife, and it's a covenant between two people. It's not a relationship where other people are invited into it. It's closed. It's committed. It's promised. Forsaking all others, clinging to your spouse. In the same way, baptism is believing in Jesus. It means that we're forsaking faith in any other God, any other belief system, and we're acknowledging Jesus is the one. Not one of many options, the one. And we declare, Jesus, all of me is committed to you. We do this because God has time and time again declared His commitment to us. He will not abandon. The gospel has shown us while we were still His enemies, He chose to love us and bring us into His family. When we believe in Him, when we're trusting in Him, when our confidence is in Him, we make a commitment in response to His commitment to us. So we're responding to what He's already done for us. We give our hearts to God and we say, God, guide me, support me, challenge me, rule over me in every area of my life. You are the Lord. Jesus, I invite you into my life fully, not as a guest, but you're the Lord. You're the master and I'm committed to you. And God's commitment to us doesn't suggest that we commit to Him. It actually demands it. It demands a commitment from us. Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. Repent and believe the good news. It's, it's a command. It's a demand. It's saying, this is what, it's an imperative. Do this. Just as God humbled himself on the cross to have a relationship with us, we are to humble ourselves in repentance to have a relationship to him. Rel believing means commitment. And the fourth one is the easiest one for all of us, I'm sure. Believing means obedience, right? That's the easiest thing to do. It's just, just obey. Just do what you're supposed to do. 
Go do the right thing. So what do we mean by obedience? So Paul talks about this obedience that came from believing, that was connected to us believing in Christ, and he was thanking God for this kind of believing faith that he saw in Christians. And this is what he said in Romans, at the, at the beginning of Romans 1, uh, verse 5. It says, through him, and, and the him he's speaking of here is Jesus, through Jesus we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Obedience. Believing leads to obedience. It leads to that. It's not you obey and then you believe. It's you believe and then now you're able to obey. It's a willingness to trust and obey God who's called us to faith in Him. James said we're not to be just hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. So believing is the root of the tree. Obedience is the fruit. Obedience happens when we really believe. If you're not obeying, somewhere you're disconnected in your belief. You're not fully having confidence. You're not fully having trust if there's disobedience. We do not come to believe and have faith by doing good works. But when we are believing in God, we will be changed to people who do good works. Faith is active. It's not merely what we think. Believing means obedience. So one of the questions that we will consider this week before we kind of wind it up here and get ready to go through the creed over the next few weeks is, is Jesus your Lord? This is a great question. Jesus is Lord is the first creed. Is He my Lord? Like, is He, is he functioning as my Lord? I mean, I've said He's my Lord, but am I obeying Him? Am I committed to Him? Am I trusting Him? Is He really? In what ways is He not? The good news is when God calls us out on things, He doesn't do it from a spirit of, I knew you screwed up, and here's your punishment. He's like he's calling us out of darkness into light because he wants us to walk with our heads up and our shoulders back, and he wants us to walk in light as children of God who are confident in him, who when the accusations of the world come, we're not affected by it. There was a, the conversion experience of John Wesley. John Wesley is the founder of Methodism, which is the Methodist church. Here's one of his journal entries that talks about his when he came to Christ. He said, on May 24, 1738, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface from the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was thus describing the changes with which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given to me that had, nev that had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So before that meeting, he, he knew that God could forgive his sins. But after that meeting, after that experience, he felt the experience of God forgiving him. So many times we can, people think of themselves as Christians but never get further than just accepting the truth of Christianity. There's not that experience of placing your faith in Jesus. So they believe there is God, but they've never met God. They, they believe He's able to forgive, but they've never asked God to forgive them. They believe God's reliable, but they've never placed their trust in Him. So these people that were on the way in, 18, in the 18th century, they were called halfway believers. You ever heard that before? I hadn't heard that really before, but halfway believers. So they were on their way to faith, but yet to arrive. So the riches of the gospel were still untapped. So where are you on your faith? Are you on your way, halfway, or is Jesus Lord? Maybe you're like John Wesley and believe the facts, but today's the day when you can say, you know what, I want that experience and I'm going to ask God to forgive me. I'm going to give my whole self to Him this very morning. That could be you. And I'm going to experience knowing that my sins are forgiven. Only through believing in Jesus, placing your anchor to Him, attaching your anchor to Him, through trusting in Him, believing in Him, only through that 
Are you really going to know that you're going to be rescued from the storms of life? That you're going to be delivered from the certainty of death? And the only way you can be connected to Jesus is through believing, trusting, and putting your confidence in Him. And here's the cool thing. I'll close with this right here. Jesus has already gone before you to do all these things. Jesus has already agreed. Believing means agreement. Jesus agreed with God that this is the only way for us to be saved was through the faithfulness of Jesus going to the cross. He's agreed. This is the only way. Jesus also trusted. He trusted God by putting His words to action and living a life of faith and perfection. He put his money where his mouth was. He didn't just say it, he proved it. He remained committed. He's already done this. He remained committed to God through the most difficult times, through temptation by Satan himself and through despondency on the cross and leading in the garden, despondency, like, God, if there's any other way, let's do that because this is, this is going to be rough. And through even having crying out on the cross, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know that he's already obeyed as well. His faith led him to obedience, even death on a cross is what that's tied to. The kind of obedience that took the sins of the world on his shoulders. So seeing what Jesus has done for us, that gives our hearts all we need to believe in him, to trust in him, to put our confidence in him, and to walk in joyful obedience. It's not a burdensome thing to obey him. It's like, yeah. I'll trust you. It doesn't make any sense to me what you're asking me to do, but based on the evidence before me, you've never failed. I'll trust you. It makes it more joyful to follow Him. It changes us. Believing changes us. No longer do we, do we grasp and search for wisdom. We don't worry about life's meaning because we know these things. We're, we're not hoping for hope in a broken world. But when we have Jesus, we realize that we have all that we could ever really even want in Him. Jesus is Lord. Put your confidence in Him. Not in a creed. The creed is going to lead us to put confidence in the Lord. Be comforted in knowing that the one true God has brought you into the one true family. Be committed to knowing that when I do commit to Jesus, I am committing to a person who will never forsake me or abandon me or disappoint me. That's nice. If you're in any type of relationship with anyone, you realize the limited ability for us not to let other people down. At some point, we will disappoint someone else and vice versa. Jesus will never do that. And we can also find joyful obedience to the one who's the only one worthy to be Lord and Master. And that's name. His name is Jesus. Jesus is Lord. I believe this morning. I believe in Him and my prayer and my hope is that you do also. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. We bless you, Lord Jesus. You've given us every reason to believe in you, to put our confidence in you, to trust you. You are perfect, good, and you are gracious. Give us hearts to believe in you more. For those today who are not fully believing you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would warm their hearts with your presence to fill them with love so that they too would be saved from the law of sin and death. Lord, we say to you, we believe in you. And in the areas where we're struggling to believe, help us in our unbelief. It's in your name, Jesus, the name above all names, the only one by which we can be saved. We pray in your name. Amen.